Allen's Honey is a third generation beekeeping family. My grandfather was a beekeeper, just a small hobbyist, but did sell his honey door to door. My father got a uh, little bit of experience beekeeping through that, but it wasn't until um, my parents bought this property. It was actually my mom's idea that my dad uh, buy a few hives of bees to run on this land, just as, because he'd always, en always enjoyed doing it with his dad. <laughs> I think that for my father, um, the bee was probably the hardest working <laughs> insect he knew, and that really appealed to him. He was, he was a very hard working man, very busy. Just gonna take some winter wraps off of the winter hives that were honey producers last year. Warm enough now, <laughs> they can go on on their own. Mechanics get bruised and busted knuckles, and secretaries get paper cuts, and beekeepers get bee stings. It's just part of the game, so. There's always, you know, winter mortality, so we'll pull those boxes where the bees have died, and we'll bring them in, get them cleaned up. Still not bad for a yard of its age. You're just, you're gonna start to see more and more queen failure as they, you know, they get older and older, so. Now that we've got all the wraps off, what we're basically doing is we've already gone through the hives a couple times. We know which ones have not made it through the winter and we got the lids flipped upside down so we'll just clean up their lids, bases and boxes and get them out of the yard. There's a lot of finger crossing and hoping that <laughs> everything has come through the winter well um, with these kind of threats to the bee, bees' health, we do experience higher winter losses. Uh, so that's always that, you know, you can't make honey with dead bees, right? So you're always, you're just hoping for a good survival. It won't be long before each one of these hives is individually running probably about 60,000 bees per hive. One thing about Saskatchewan honey is that, you know, this, this province makes really good honey. You know, we're in the, the bread basket of Canada, right? So there's just such a multitude of crops in the area and the diversity makes for a very pleasant, mild tasting honey. Predominantly, we look at what we can do for the bees first. So what, if it's a nice day, what bee work can we do? A lot of things with bees are timing. You've got to go and you've got to take care of their needs first. Right now, what we're working with is basically we've gone through all of yards, we've assessed their strengths. Uh, what Danny and I are doing is we're going and we're patching up stuff that isn't doing well. What part of our staff is doing is uh, moving the new colonies into full-size colonies so they can be ready for honey production. I'm starting to do the queen work, so I have a schedule for that. I look at what's rated as quite high, what looked good to the guys out there. Just, I go to the field, I look at that colony, assess it if I want to use it, um, and if it looks really good, then that's potentially um, a queen that I'm going to use. So I'm just gonna check quick to make sure that there's graftable age larvae. So this is honey here. That's the larva. And I'm looking for larva that has just changed from an egg into the larva. The earlier you graft, the better queen you'll get. 
see a, a couple little graftable larvae in here. I don't need a lot because I'm only going to try to do about 20 grafts today. So we will start with this one. What I do is I grab a bee brush to brush these bees off. You don't want to shake the bees off because they'll dislodge the egg from their bed of royal jelly. Um. Queens take about 16 days to develop fully. When I graft them, it's considered their fourth day. On their 14th or 15th day, I'll come and I'll take those cells and I'll put them into a nucleus colony where she'll hatch in a couple weeks mate and then hopefully that'll give us a new colony. Because this is my first graft, if they only make five good ones out of there, next time I'll only graft five. I'm grafting ten today and just see what they can do. And then I'll make them stronger. We try to make between five and seven hundred new colonies every year. As soon as I've got a frame done, I like to put it in the colony just to make sure that they get start getting fed right away. All right, so these colonies here are called cell builders. And I've put them in specialized equipment so that I can manipulate their queen right versus queenless states so that they will build queen cells out of these eggs that I've grafted. When a queen lays a fertilized egg, it has the potential to become a worker bee or a queen. All bees are fed a certain amount of royal jelly, but eggs that are destined to be queens are fed copious amounts of it. So basically all I need to do is take that fertilized egg and as long as these guys are in a state of wanting to make queens, they'll make queens out of those eggs as long as I haven't damaged them. Here, these cell builders, I grafted a frame of larva into yesterday. So what we're going to do, once I have left that larva in there for about 24 hours, I make this colony queen right again. They will have started to feed those eggs and once they've started to rear them as queen cells, I can put it back into a queen right situation and they will continue to feed them. And again, these cell builders aren't quite as strong yet as I would like, so I wouldn't be surprised if they haven't made all of the graphs, maybe just half of them. Well, look at these guys, prove me wrong. They've started to work on all 10 of them. They will both start filling it with royal jelly, as well as start developing that queen cell. At the base of these cells, there's like a milky white substance, that's the royal jelly. I try to concentrate on doing this work in June. Um, by the time we get to mid-July, we're pretty busy with honey. So, so I, this is my June, is just making as many queens as we can. When I became interested in the operation, it allowed him to move from something that he was eventually kind of just going to dwindle down and sell off to kind of there was new blood in it and he started to expand. We're a small commercial operation. We only run about a thousand honey producing hives. Um, the larger bee uh, commercial operations in the province are, you know, 4,000 or more. Generally, the honey that's produced is a lighter, milder flavored honey, and kind of to the general population, that's more appealing. The majority of the world makes um, darker, sharper tastings honey. Saskatchewan honey is often used to ameliorate or improve the quality of those darker honeys by lessening the sharpness of the flavor and also lightening the color. In terms of production being as high as it is, we have just such a plentiful bloom. You know, it's very short, like we get about six weeks as our honey production, but the just square acres of bloom at that time allows us to have a very high yield of honey.
So these were the the hunting boxes that we had collected from the yards earlier. So it's the ones we went out and tipped and then we went back out and blew them out, the bees out. And now we're bringing them home and they'll go into the hot room. So that's our room where they sit at, again, high temperatures. They sit around that 95 to 100 degrees, kind of, just to keep them warm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put these cell cups into an incubator for travel, and then we're gonna take them to a yard that we've put some uh, six frame colonies down in, and we've given them a frame of brood and some bees, but they don't have a queen. And so this will become their queen. We'll put the cell in there, she'll hatch, she'll mate, and then she takes over that colony. And that's how we make a replacement stock. On their 16th day, they animate. <laughs> I mean, they're always alive, right? But that's where they are fully form, and then they actually chew their way out of this. And that'll keep them nice and cozy during transport. I make labels. Um, just to track the genetics that we're using. And I'll put these on the nukes too. Right, so this yard, I'm just putting a couple cells in where the other batch didn't take. So sometimes there's a problem with uh, the queen, she chills or, um, you know, she could be sick so she doesn't hatch. Sometimes the colony's too weak that you're putting her into and she, she chills because they don't keep her warm. Just not a 100% success rate like anything in nature. Uh, so I am just looking for the ones that didn't hatch well and I have them marked with their genetic tag on top. So this is one of them. And actually they're trying to rear their own new cell because they know that they don't have a queen but I'm going to stop that because I want them to accept mine. And when you're transporting bees from one colony to another, you do need to add something that's going to uh, keep them in that colony because otherwise they'll abandon it. Then you take that cell, you just put it on the frame by the brood, like so. And there we go. And then on Sunday, she'll hatch out. Um, upon hatching, they feed her, they take care of her. And usually, depending on weather, about 10 to 16 days, she'll take her mating flight. <laughs> if I can find that queen again, we're gonna mark her. We mark the queens with the color of the year that they are. And that allows us in future to know if the colony is supersedured or if it still has the queen I originally put in there. And she goes back to work. She's much easier to find now though, right? The first step in the extraction process is the full honey supers are coming out of the heat room. And you get lined up here at the head of the machine where the frames are unboxed. So the frames are being unboxed from there and then it is being fed into the uncapper. The frames go down through a set of counter rotating blades to open the honey up. So essentially as the bees fill the frames, they put a wax covering over top of them to seal the honey in. And uh, the uncapper that they're feeding these boxes and frames into uh, have a knife inside there that opens that portion of it up so that you can extract the honey from the frames. Even though the machine does most of the work for you, there's still always a bit that it can't get. Okay. So there does have to be a little hand scratching. So that's, we've got a couple people set up here so that as the frames are coming past them, if they see anything that still has cappings on it, they can just scratch it off real quick. grabs 30 frames, pushes in 30 full frames, and 30 empty frames exit the backside onto that stationary conveyor. Gets the conveyor back running again, so the frames are moving up. Make sure that the, everything is nice and right in there. Closes it back up and sets up for the next one. 
So the extractor is will hold 120 frames and it, it takes about approximately seven minutes to spin out a load. So this machine slowly spins faster and faster and it goes from you know just a few RPM and up higher and higher and gradually gets faster and as it gets faster the honey starts to spin out more and more. As the honey is pumped from the extractor, it comes up, down over, and into the heat tube over there, which warms the honey up to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, just the right temperature. And then it comes into the spinner, which is just a spinning centrifugal drum. And the honey drops in there, comes out to the outside wall, migrates down the wall. The, any wax stays on the inside of the drum and is scraped from the inside of the drum and it falls down out the center of the machine. The honey keeps migrating down and then is spun out into this drum collection unit. And then the honey from there goes down into a central collection tank and then is pumped over into the storage tanks in the hot room. After the honey's extracted and it's uh, collected into the main storage tanks, then we come to the drum filling area, so we'll put on a clean, empty drum, uh, get the tear on the drum, and then proceed to filling. One thing that makes us fairly unique, though, is that uh, we do package and sell our own product under Howland's Honey. Uh, so we do both the commercial bulk side of, of things as well as doing the farmers markets and retail market. mite was, uh, was a parasite that lived on a species, species of bee that originated in the Asian countries and through the transportation of bees from one geographical area to another area it allowed for that varroa mite to hop from this particular Asian species of bee onto say like a European style bee and then was brought back to North America just, you know, through movement of bees and ended up in here and, you know, it didn't have the same symbiotic relationship that it had with the Asian bee because most parasites don't want to kill their host, they want to just live off of it. And with that jumping of species, it's, you know, now decimating, decimating the, the bees. But I mean, this is something that's been going on since the 60s like this is not a this is nothing new the product name is called thymobar it's a thymol based treatment so it's a fumigant for the treatment of the varroa mite you know it has its main uses for the varroa mite and then it has you know, other health benefits for the bees in treating other problems. And it's kind of a fix-all. It's not a, it's not a pesticide. It's, it's more of a natural product, so. The only place now that doesn't <laughs> actually have the Roa mite is Australia. Everywhere else in the world is, is dealing with it. Well, I mean, there's definitely something to be said for being your own boss, for sure. But I mean, aside from that aspect, this the, the rewardingness of being with nature all the time in what you do. I mean, we spend the majority of our time outdoors, working with nature, in and amongst nature. It just, it's rewarding every day. You know, there's, you get up, go trot around outside, play with some bees make some honey.
there's a lot of it. <laughs> You're making it sound like a ton of fun. There's a lot of it that's really hard, <laughs> heavy, oh, for awful sure. work, you know. But it is a day of manual labor too. And like both Danny and I find that like we'd rather have a day of, of hard work than like a day of stress. But the better care you take of the bees, the more rewarding your results are going to be. So that's really fulfilling too, because what you put in does come out. I really like bees, <laughs> you know, um, and they're, they're beneficial to our environment. You know, it's, um, it's good, clean, rewarding work. We struggle when, you know, there are a lot of things out there that are affecting bee health and that is a stress. That's definitely a lot of things you can't control that, that are, are being, you know, that are happening. And um, that would be the one stressor that you can't, you know, control much for. So. Once, once I got involved and you know spent some time in it, it's it's very addicting. It's something that once it gets in your blood, it's very hard to get out. You know, you just you really fall into the the culture of beekeeping. You know, you could you'd call it more of a culture than a career or a business. It's it's a lifestyle choice. It really is. Like it's not something that everybody's willing to do or wants to do. But once you once you do it and you get to know it, you really just fall in love with it. So I can't imagine doing anything else. If you have program ideas that you'd like to see on Max TV Local On Demand, write us at max.local at sastel.com.